You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Uh, taking a moment to hop on, do a live stream, even though I'm still on a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, I'm glad to be here, though. Hopefully, you guys are doing well. I want to shout out uh, all of you folks who hit me up on the Discord. By the way, we have a Discord, the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Uh, we do different activities on there we're trying to get more members uh to have uh more conversations click the link in the description or at the top of the chat uh the chat room box you can click the link there as well but shout out to all you guys who hit me up on the discord telling me how much you appreciate the show um some of you also mentioned the pro black perspective when you do so so i appreciate all you guys for the kind comments and keeping me in mind also i want to say keep you guys in mind too i want to shout out dorico cooper photography i haven't seen dorico around really since he announced the tragic passing of his father but i hope he's doing well uh shout out to daily affirmations by pauline uh she got her she got her t-shirt and i'm to shoot the breeze i tried to periodically do a, a free t-shirt giveaway uh i sent the rico cooper photography his shirt not sure if you got it or not but daily affirmations by pauline got hers you can see her right there looking lovely uh shirt looks good she had a lot of compliments for the t-shirt so uh definitely uh, appreciate her for always tuning in and for always giving great topics for the shoot the breeze. I'm glad she was able to finally get her t-shirt and I hope it's something that she will cherish for a little while to come. So once again, thank you to Daily Affirmations by Pauline for sending me a picture of her wearing her Bitter Medicine Podcast t-shirt. All right. So uh, I want to remind you guys, before we start this paper, I want to remind you guys, this show is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. There are other shows on the network that I hope you're tuning into. This is DA you tuning to the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace family, this is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes indeed, make sure to check out those shows, Harsh Reality Podcast, always doing it up. Same thing with the pro-black perspective, those guys really keep putting our content and uh it'll only help uh the podcast network to grow uh hopefully we can announce a new show being added soon shout out to revolutionary matron who's in the chat room saying greetings greetings to you my dear uh so you guys make sure to check out those shows as well as uh go and subscribe to the kwaz radio uh, channel there's some work i'm supposed to do on that channel that i you know i got so much going on it's hard to do if you want to volunteer to help the kwaz radio channel 
to be able to uh, attract, retain uh, podcast shows, etc. You know, reach out to email at kwaz.radio, so that's kwaz.radio at gmail.com. Uh, offer your assistance if you, have, if you have the time, you know, it'd be appreciated. Uh, KW Don 7 is in the room, Sawabona. Uh, KW Don 7 is another one of the guys who really make this worthwhile. Revolutionary Matron is here. And by the way, you guys check out Revolutionary Matron's channel. She's been dropping some episodes of her upcoming show, uh, kind of like test episodes, I guess you could call them. But interesting all the same. And also, check out the episode she did, I believe it was last Saturday, on the pro-black perspective. She did a, an episode where she was uh, doing basically a personality test. It was pretty cool. Uh, I was in the chat room as well. A few other people from, from the chat room here was over there too, as memory serves. So you guys check out those recent episodes of those shows as well. All right, Thursday night, uh, I decided to jump on and do a show and the topic I'm bringing is uh, a profile of an independent black institution, African-centered education at work. This paper was by Carol D. Lee of the School of Education and Social Policy from Northwestern University. Now you guys know that the main project uh, for the Bitter Medicine Podcast is to, is to create a, a new, up-to-date, African-centered, uh, and eventually Pan-African-centered curriculum. So a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the papers that I read are along those lines about education. And the reason why that is the case is because I understand, you should as well, that to nation build, right? It requires, fundamentally, it requires education. Fundamentally, nation building requires education. As a matter of fact, if you were to go on Wikipedia and, and type in nation building and then you scroll down, I mean, you could read the other stuff that's there, right? But if you scroll down, right? Because uh, in, in fact, if you read the, the other stuff that's there, you will actually read about nations of Africa, you know, briefly as well, right? But if you scroll down all the way to the bottom, there's a section called the role of education in nation building. And I think it's an interesting read. It says the expansion of primary school provision is often believed to be a key driver in the process of nation building. Hear it again. The expansion of primary school provision is often believed to be a key driver in the process of nation building. European rulers during the 19th century relied on state-controlled primary schooling to teach their subjects a common language, a shared identity, and a sense of duty and loyalty to the regime. So when I talk about African-centered and uh, ultimately pan-African-centered curriculum, understand the importance if you want to talk about strong nations and superpowers and power and and whatnot you better start working on how you educate particularly the children but of course education is for all right you better understand that so when i bring these these uh papers and i discuss uh african centered uh education african centered curriculum I want you guys to really take it seriously. And when you take it seriously, join the Discord and ask, how can I help? How can you help uh, in creating this education that we need to have? That's a prerequisite if we're going to talk about nation building. Right? To continue with that Wikipedia thing, in Prussia, mass primary education was introduced 
to foster loyalty, obedience, and devotion to the king. These beliefs about the power of education and forming loyalty to the sovereign were adopted by states in other parts of the world as well, in both non-democratic and democratic contexts. Reports on schools in the Soviet Union illustrate the fact that government-sponsored education programs emphasize not just academic content and skills, but also taught a love of country and mercilessness to the enemy, stubbornness, and iron discipline, love of oppressed peoples, spirit of adventure, constant striving. These are some of the characteristics, as well as others that are, uh, that are by nature African, are things that we need to do if we want to change our condition. Is what we need to do to change our condition. Right? Revolutionary Matron says, claim the continent. You need an education to claim the continent. This is why we have, I know the great discussion on the Pan-African discussion, that's the that's only time I say from the pro-black perspectives uh, discord. Great discussion about this uh, recently. Uh, it's probably still going on. I haven't checked into it. But education is important, right? I don't know. It looks like YouTube is doing something strange. Can you guys let me know in the chat room if you hear me? And if I sound well? Of course, YouTube is back to the BS again. Because my, my setup is clean. Right, hardwired to the internet shouldn't be a problem. So let me let me get into this paper before YouTube uh, just makes this whole thing unlistenable. You guys, let me know if I can be heard. If I before I switch over, you guys, let me know if I can be heard in the chat. All right. In the prophetic novel, 2,000 Seasons of 1979, Ayi uh, uh, Kauai Armour challenges black people to find sustenance in their origins. He calls especially on those he describes as, quote, you hearers, seers, imaginers, thinkers, remembers, you prophets called to communicate truths of the living to a people fascinated unto death, end of quote. Arma asks that black people look beyond the confusion of the present, find ways of, quote, linking those gone, ourselves here, those coming, end of quote. As he continues, the eyes of the seers should range far into purposes. The ears of the hearers should listen far toward origins. Utterers' voice should make knowledge of the way, of heard sounds and visions seen. The voice of utterers should make this knowledge inevitable, impossible to lose. Part of the quick fix mentality, a single solution approach that has characterized reform efforts in American schools has focused on simplistic solutions, for example, including African American history in the curriculum of inner city schools will elevate the self esteem of poor black youth, changing the school climate to one of higher expectations will result in a safer school environment. Creation of single sex schools for black males will solve their disciplinary and academic problems. The appropriation of culturally non-specific instructional models by whole language and process approaches to teaching composition skills will improve reading and writing deficiencies. Reciprocal teaching of cognitive apprenticeship, emphasizing critical thinking skills, will teach complex thinking processes. Each of these remedies has value and applicability to underachieving ethnically diverse and poor students, as well as the so-called quote-unquote mainstream middle-class students who are not competing academically in the world test market. Isolation, however, each is incomplete. All right, seems like I'm being heard well here in this live stream, cool. Take a sip of water too. Uh, for example, the inclusion of a truthful view of American and world history 
that includes the contributions and perspectives of the variety of African Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, and Hispanic Americans, as well as those of underrepresented Eastern European groups, is vital to America's salvation and maximal development. Facing a population whose majority will be people of color by the next century, the U.S. must come to terms with the fact that two major holocausts provide the foundation on which much of American history rests. The African Holocaust, which lasted for 400 years and resulted in the death or the enslavement of literally tens of millions of lives, and the Native American Holocaust, in which entire nations of indigenous people lost their land, their autonomy, and their lives. However, the relationship between historical accuracy and self-esteem is not clear. Research on self-concept among African-American youth indicates that a distinction must be made between personal self-esteem and group concept. That is, the personal self-concept of individual African-American youth is likely to be high, while his or her understanding of the way in which black people and the physical characteristics of black people are valued in the society may be reflective of low self-esteem. Additionally, Fine's 1991 research indicated that African-American high school dropouts may have quite high self-esteem, and Hale Benson in 1986 has observed that many African-American male children demonstrate strong and aggressive leadership qualities beginning in the primary grades. Delpit has raised serious questions about the wholesale applicability of process approaches to teaching composition to underachieving African-American children, and by implication, other open-ended uh, models such as whole language. Delpit argues that children from politically disenfranchised ethnic groups should be explicitly taught the quote-unquote rules of power for language use, including acceptable school norms. Similar observations for bilingual populations have been made by Reyes in 1991. The reservations articulated by these ethnically diverse researchers indicate the need for comprehensive approaches that take into account the cultural knowledge and political needs of non-mainstream student populations. Rather than simply complain and react, Independent African Center School Movement has taken a proactive stance, finding within the community context the possibilities and gifts that black children offer the world, and creating institutions to manifest its ideals. Institutions validate knowledge, help to shape visions, inculcate values, and provide the foundation for community stability. So when you look at the instability generally speaking, of black society, right? We can link that right back to education and, and uh, learning institution. To continue, over the past 20 years, New Concept Development Center, the NCDC, in Chicago, Illinois, along with other independent black institutions, also known as IDIs, across the country has strived to educate and socialize African-American children to assume their future roles as political, intellectual, spiritual, and economic leaders in their communities. Its vision is one in which black people are self-reliant, productive, self-defining, firmly rooted in family and community. A vision NCDC's founders and staff hope will be impossible for its students to lose. Right? What do you, all, what do you guys think about that vision? Right? Self-reliant, productive, self-defining, and firmly rooted in family and community. I think that's a solid, I think that's a solid uh, vision to have, right? I think that's a solid vision to have. In the chat room, Revolutionary Matron says, I can hear you. I think that increasing the workload for African coursework that is meaningful will benefit our children greatly. I know many people that dropped out because they were bored. Yeah, that's the, that's the biggest thing you hear out of school. If you have kids or kids around you in some capacity, 
the biggest thing you'll hear from most of these kids i heard it for my children for sure at certain points in their, in their primary or elementary school education that they were bored and if you're bored then you start getting to, into certain behavioral uh, activities that you know might get you in a problem but let's not forget too that the public school system is designed that way they know that these kids uh they can increase the workload in a positive way by that i mean not just giving them endless hours of homework right but they know that they can do stuff that that connects the students uh personal life right their culture their community to to what they're doing in these schools that are in these kids' neighborhood already. They they know that they could connect that stuff, but they don't do it because again, that's the beginning of their pipeline to prison. And if you know that as African people, we gotta make the changes to prevent it from happening. Right? The best thing you could do is homeschool your children. Right? If you can stay home with them and do it, then you that's what that's what you should be doing. If you can't, then you should be giving your kids enough material at home that, you know, that uh, gives them the information that they need, right? To make them self-reliant, productive, self-defining, and firmly rooted in family and community. And that's it. So join the efforts, whatever it is, efforts to, to create uh, a blueprint, a uh, guideline for children to, to, to get uh, the vision that, that these folks have been reading about. You should, you should join those efforts. You should always join those efforts. Even if it's to offer your kids, so to speak, uh, to be case studies. Join the effort to continue. The profile is offered for several reasons. First, new IBIs are opening up across the country, and they often call on members of established institutions for advice. Yet no matter how many independent schools are founded in the near future, they cannot begin to serve the majority of African American children. The schools such as NCDC can also offer instructive models of development for public schools. Lessons of the nation's independent African centered schools are particularly relevant for several reasons. Public school parents, students, and educators are becoming increasingly interested in culturally responsive curriculum and pedagogy. Efforts to reform urban schools are focusing on providing greater autonomy at the school site level and establishing community based school councils with formal input from teaching staff. Now, again, they could have been do been done this stuff. This ain't something that folks just realized. They could have been doing this, but it will kill their pipeline. And so one of my issues with authors, as you often hear me say, is how about you write about the subject matter and include the facts? The facts are there's a school to prison pipeline. That's how they you know, in the public food system, it's how they fund it, it's how they fuel it. This is what they could be doing, right, to refer, to re reform these urban schools, etc. But they don't want to do it. So therefore, in your, in your article here, you got to be suggesting, folks, join collectives, organize, create curricula for your kids. Simple. To continue. Thirdly, the dismal failure of public education for African American students clearly indicates the need for alternative influences. While the gap between white and black student achievement on the national assessment of educational progress has narrowed, 
The average African American high school graduate only scored as well as the average white eighth grade student in reading. High school dropout rates of 50%, particularly among black males, are not unusual in large urban districts like Chicago and New York. A lot of the express needs for culturally responsive and comprehensive reform, the evolution and example of independent African-centered community-based schools such as NCDC are highly relevant to the larger issues of public education in the United States. This brings us to a section called Early Beginnings. Uh, NCDC first opened its doors in 1972 in the midst of the Black Power and Black Arts movements, as well as the heightened international movement for Pan-African unity. It began as a Saturday school program, servicing African-American children between the ages of 2 and 12. The program concept emerged from a small group of Black intellectuals who had been working with the independent Black publishing company. Third World Press, which had begun five years early in 1967. The founding group included poets, uh, Haki Mad Pabudi, Johari Amini, and Sterling Plump, educators uh, Safisha Mad Pabudi, uh, I guess that's Carol Easton, now Carol Lee, the author of this paper, Jabari Mahiri, and Soyini Ricks Walton. Our goal was to develop an educational institution within Chicago's black community that would teach African-American history and culture, as well as imbue the values of black self-love, cooperation among the children it served. Moreover, it was envisioned that this institution would operate independent of resources and influences outside the black community. So already, noble effort. But is it, a, is it an African-centered education? You see, when you talk about, uh, just to go back to something that they said here, when you talk about teaching African-American history, culture, that means that for the most part, that's going to mean that you're teaching about slavery and everything that precedes slavery in America. Now, is it good for Africans in America to, to learn about slavery at a young age? Sure. Because it will give them an opportunity to understand who their enemy is from an early age. But we're more, even Africans in America, are more than just slavery. So I would say already that this school needed to widen out uh, its influence, right? Or I should say its inspiration. Right? But a couple of things I like in this. I like the fact that there was a mix of educators, right? Black power and black and black arts movement types involved in this. And like I've said on the Discord, like I've said on this uh, podcast before, that's one of the things I want the Discord to really have a bunch of. I want a bunch of black arts types musicians, artists, poets, because it's the inside, it's, it's the insight, sorry, from these different perspectives that you want in a curriculum. Truly, right, so let's continue. Uh, uh, at its inception, NCDC was the only program under the auspices of the Institute of Positive Education, or the IPE. NCDC staff constituted the initial board of directors of the entire IPE operation. Since then, a cadre of full-time workers and volunteers has evolved to carry out IEPE programs, which have included over the course of the past 20 years, a community lecture series, a pamphlet series, 
black books bulletin magazine in typesetting operation hieroglyphs inc and the ujama food cooperative right oh that, that, that sounds good right although membership in ip was open stringent work and study schedule was demanded of its staff as part of a lengthy incorporation process early members of the board collectively developed guidelines that stipulated the rights and responsibilities of membership they met monthly to conduct business and at least bi-monthly to study as a group uh if you're listening to this because sometimes i forget these things so i like to put it out there in case you wanted to help with something uh <clears throat> You know, I'd like to get more information on this collective. So if you don't mind doing a little research, pulling up some pamphlets, perhaps, some lecture series notes or whatever, you know, hit me on the Discord in my DM and give me whatever you can get. I'll, if I remember uh, sometime later in the week, I'll look it up myself. But in case I don't, it'll be nice if you want to volunteer to help with something let's look this up let's get a better understanding of how this organization worked all right to continue they met monthly to conduct business and at least bi-monthly to study as a group this is the kind of stuff i like to hear these study sessions included focus on such classic texts as the destruction of black civilization by chancellor williams 2000 seasons the miseducation of the negro by carter g woodson Crisis of the Negro Intellectual by Harold Cruz, and From Plan to Planet by Don L. Lee. Now, Haki Ahmad Kubudi, as her husband, as well as readings related to diet, exercise, and health. And, and that right there is exactly what I like to hear. Right? I like to hear about that because that's exactly how I view this work. This work needs to happen along those lines. You're, as instructors and, and leaders and writers of, a, of this kind of curriculum, you have to be fully immersed, constantly studying, journaling, and presenting uh, concepts and new concepts to you and new ideas, right? To keep the, to keep the interests of the curriculum, of the, of the students who are partaking in this curriculum, right to keep it evolving to keep it up to date all the time you know uh that's what you need to do and it, it requires effort right you can hear it in this reading it requires effort and you know i was reading or rereading message to the people recently by marcus garvin and one of the things that garvey understood and whenever you talk about organizing and creating organizations and whatnot. Uh, and, and, and by the way, what I'm about to say is also why some people would say the internet is not for organized. Uh, Garvey understood that in organizations and organizing, you have to be seeing your people face to face on a regular. Like Garvey would say, you have to be in people's homes sometimes. Go and check on Brother Calvin and see what's up with him. Hey, Sister uh, Sister Renee, I haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? Right? Now, the thing about that is that the world is different now. And we should be able to use the tools of this present world. The problem with that is that, and, and, and this is where... It's not the technology that's the problem, it's the human. The human hasn't changed their ways, hasn't opened up their mindset. So to, to hold people accountable in, 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 in organization, you have to be able to reach out and touch them. In, an, a, a, in a world now where people don't want to be reached out to and touched. So the idea that these folks have here to meet once or twice or whatever a month is a sound idea. It goes back to what Gabi would talk about, right? And the only reason why you would have to do that 
still today is because if I just have you on the internet, which the Discord is an example of, if we're just trying to meet up and do stuff on the internet, folks won't really be accountable. So what am I saying? I'm saying a part of what we need to do as people as well is start focusing on accountability. Let's stop being the bare minimum human. And let's exert some effort and stop being these folks where if I, I got to come and look you up at your house or something like that, or catch you going from your car to your house or something to make you accountable. We have all this technology where even colleges and stuff are online now. And folks are getting whole degrees on uh, online. So if there's a forum to do work and the forum requires to meet online or something, people should be jumping to do that. At least you could do that from the comfort of your home or wherever you are. Right? We got to start working on our accountability and stop using low energy human behave behavior, right? As an excuse. But anyway, I digress. The point I'm trying to make here is based off what you're reading here, these guys are constantly studying. Obviously, they're keeping each other accountable by meeting regularly, seeing each other face to face and studying together. Right? Studying together. To continue, as IPE's program roster expanded, so did the specializations of staff members. By the time NCDC expanded in 1974 from a Saturday tutorial and cultural enrichment program to a full-time day school, this is what I'm talking about. IPE staffers had specialized into teachers, typeset, editorial and advertising staff and other specializations according to their roles in the various operations. Although in some instances, staff members brought related training and experience to their jobs at IPE, many staff were apprenticed into skills for which they had little or no, pri or no prior training. Most of the early NCDC staff, although college trained, had little formal experience working with young children. Thus, while we knew the end goals we wished to achieve, we had little idea how to translate our goals into developmentally appropriate learning activities for young children. Right? Now, this is, this is a heavy point she's making here. This is, this is why you need bodies. You need people contributing towards the work. On the Discord, some months back, I posted a PDF of African-centered curriculum. And I asked folks to critique it. The idea was not to tear down the work that the brother put in to the curriculum, but it was to show that the curriculum definitely needed updating. And one of the things I took away from reading my study of the curriculum, my critiquing of the curriculum, is that clearly, there was this one brother who put it together, maybe a brother and a, and a lady. I, I, I can't quite remember, but it was like one or two people put it together. And if one or two people do this kind of work, this kind of work that we're talking about, the appropriate learning activities, et cetera, for young, if you leave that to one person, you're going to get the kind of curriculum that we saw on the Discord when, when we, when we uh, critiqued it. By the way, if you're still interested in critiquing that curriculum, hit me up and I'll get it to you. And you could, uh, uh, I'll give you the document as well. You, uh, you can put together uh, your critique of the curriculum. I, I'll, I'll actually like to do a show, an episode of the show, where I discuss those critiques. That was the plan months ago and uh was waiting for other folks to hand theirs in and kind of got lost in the sauce right but that's something i'd like to really do right we gotta get together and work right in this sense the early years of the institution were educational ones for both the ip staff 
as well as the community we served. Many staff were young and fresh out of school, either high school or college. But a few key staff were mature adults with wide experiences in fields ranging from advertising to woodworking. None of the businesses created by IPE was ever intended to make significant money for individuals. Rather, they were founded to provide needed services within the black community, to generate sufficient revenue, to continually upgrade the services and modestly support those who work within them. Staff members who worked outside jobs voluntarily donated money monthly to support the business operations. As the businesses flourished and staff grew to 25 people, it became apparent that the original structure was too unwieldy to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the expanded organization. A smaller administrative body, democratically elected, responsive to the entire staff, and guided by African-centered values. Okay, now we've, now we've hit African-centered values, which I like. Was thus formed to manage IPE's daily operations. This first administrative body was called the Baraza Ya Kazi, meaning the work council. I love it. I love it. You'll see me use Kiswahili terms like on the Discord and stuff as well. And different works that I do, you'll see the pro-black perspective do something similar. Right? I love it. In 1974, primarily to house NCDC's expanding operations, IPE purchased and moved into a larger facility. They also purchased a large tract of land in South Haven, Michigan, for use as a retreat site and for gardening. Are, are any of you guys live with me familiar with this area? Or with this school? Is this anything you're familiar with? By 1977, the school had grown to a point that necessitated its devising formal means of incorporating the voice of parents into the governance of the school. 1977, NCDC formed its own board of directors called the NCDC Coordinating Council. Half of this council was comprised of IP staff members, including representation from NCDC teachers the majority of whom were also IPE staff. The other half consisted of representatives elected by parents to represent their interests and points of view. This council remains in effect to this day. However, because NCDC is presently the primary activity of IPE, the NCDC Coordinating Council presently functions as the organization's overall board of directors. Over the years, the council has both expanded its membership uh, its membership representation, as well as refined its administrative skills in such areas as law, real estate, finance, and advertising. Presently includes formal representation from the school, IP's newly formed Mary McLeod Bethune Teacher Training Institute for parent and teacher education in public schools. NCDC parent body and persons from the general community with particular skills and resources who represent the interests of the larger community. Bring us to a section called Challenges of Expansion and Evolution. In particular, we are at this section called Staff and Leadership Development. So I read that section in the chat room, there's been some activity. Uh, Revolutionary Matron says, authors have to promote the ideas of the degree or license granting, I guess that's institution. You do not own the education validated by them. She goes on to say, these efforts need the skills and knowledge of the entire African community globally. I agree with that 100%. She goes on to say, it is not good to only teach African Americans about slavery. Right? Uh, Revolutionary Matrons goes on to say, volunteers are needed. Hashtag, get on the team. And uh, if you listen to the episode, the last episode of the Pro Black Perspective, as I mentioned before, Revolutionary Matron was on that show doing a personality test. And uh, one of the things she mentioned along the way was, get on the team. Uh, she mentioned the Bitter Medicine podcast and the Discord and what we're doing, what we're trying to do. She said, get on the team, and I was there. I heard it. I agree. Revolution Matron says, I have never heard of this. 
Oh uh, yeah, cause Matron is in, um, well, she's in the state, I guess, of Michigan, right? Uh, but she's never heard of it. Working in an independent black institution has always been an, ad an avocation of dedication. The philosophical basis of the independent school movement precludes simplistic notions of working within them as merely a job. As long as community-based institutions with limited financial resources remain small and are staffed by highly politicized and youthful staff, the consistency of their organizational vision is generally predictable. However, as these organizations grow, they must find ways to generate new leadership and resources. Founding and it, the founding and early NCDC staffers consistently work 12 to 16 hours a day and fulfilled multiple responsibilities. Staff members aged and began to raise families, and take on greater financial burdens in an increasingly inflationary economy. These expectations cannot be reasonably maintained. And that is all a part of the game, right? The game is that, the game is that unless you, have a successful business, whatever success is to you in your situation, you're gonna be working for someone. The reality too, let me just throw this out there. A lot of folks will kind of shit on black folks who have to go and work for the man, so to speak. But a lot of these folks doing it are, are folks who have inheritances and all kind of stuff. Don't let folks fool you, right? But, but the idea is that if you gotta work for these people, you have to work so much for them that you, it's hard for you to do the things that you would really like to do, right? It's hard for you to do the things that you'd really like to do. So it's true that the folks who went into this NCDC as, as, as early staffers, working all those hours, like they say 12 to 16, and I know some people heard that and groaned, right? Not those of you who are live with me, but some people in the playback will hear that and be like, man, 12 to 16 hours, right? And this is why a lot of folks don't get involved. This is why a lot of folks don't get on the team afraid to put in that work but by the time you work for these for, for the man for these other people you don't have the opportunity to do the work that you would like to do and if you're not careful this is the problem with organizations that that that, that we could create is uh is the funding part and the, and, and the, the, the ability to compensate people for their work so even the best intentioned people tend to fall off eventually. That's why it's good to try to get numbers so that you lessen the workload. This is why a revolutionary matron is telling you join the team. You get enough hands, serious hands at work. You don't have to spend 12 to 16 hours a day doing the work. Training teachers to impart the appropriate cultural knowledge, ideological perspectives into their instruction at African centered schools has not been an easy task. Mainstream university teacher training programs, on the whole, do not prepare teachers to be responsive to diverse cultural concerns in their instruction. And they certainly do not prepare them to work in schools like NCDC. A major source of continuity and reinforcement for teachers in independent schools have been the National Teacher Training Institutes of the Council of Independent Black Institutions, SIBI. We've talked about SIBI in the past on this show too. Since 1975, SIBI has offered two-week training seminars on how to develop and sustain an IDI. Recent years, uh, the Teacher Training institutes, Institutes have expanded to provide training for public school educators and parents on African-centered curriculum, right? Uh, if you're in the chat room for me, uh, Revolutionary Matron, 
Okay, W. Don't say. Uh, can you guys look and tell me if Council of Independent Black Institutions, Sibi, is that still active? Just let me know in the chat room if that's still active, please. Attempts over the years to recruit graduates from traditional teacher training institutions or entice average public school teachers to work at NCDC have proved disastrous. For instance, years ago, as the center's first director, I was interviewing applicants for an elementary school level position at the center. One young African-American woman, a teacher, education program graduate, came into the building, godly scrutinized its walls, which were resplendent, which, which were which were resplendent with pictures of black heroes and heroines, black art and artifacts, and asked in amazement, is this place all black? Without waiting for a reply, she quickly turned around and walked up. Now imagine that. Imagine we have Negroes, right? Walk into a black institution, a black institution of learning. And become intimidated or pissed off at how black it is. That's just crazy. This is why, you know, we did that reading of the paper about the profile of an Afrocentric or African-centered teacher. That's why we need to get and create perhaps more African-centered teachers, right? And, and, and by the way, this is also why the task is so daunting. This is also why it's hard to get people to really put in effort to volunteer time, because there's so much things you need to build up to get to the thing that you're trying to do, right? It's like if you have to build, it's like if you're trying to build a car, but you have to go back and build an alternator, you gotta build a solenoid switch, you gotta weld and build a muffler and, and, and then put it all together just to get to the car, right? It's kind of a daunting task, but it is so necessary we need to be willing to take on the task, to continue. Experience has shown that the most effective means of training new staff to engage in NCDC's culture responsive mode of teaching is to have beginning teachers spend their first year as assistants or apprentices to experienced teachers, right? And that only makes sense to, and maybe I, this may sound super critical, but I, I, I would think that would be the first thing you try to do. We know what it's like out here when it comes to our folks, right? I would think the first thing you want to do is just that, right? NCDC also maintains an ongoing staff development program. Teachers meet weekly by section and monthly as an entire staff to discuss problem, uh, programs and problems. They, need month, they meet monthly for staff development sessions conducted by the school's program coordinator, university professors, former CDC, uh, oh, sorry, NCDC, CDC, NCDC staff with specializations in science and mathematics. These sessions have included studies in African-American history and culture, as well as intensive review of theories of learning, introductions and new strategies for teaching various content areas and culture responsive manipulatives and teaching units moreover ncdc pays for its teachers to attend relevant seminars and workshops offered at local universities or teacher centers so for ncdc to do that all right which is another thing i need to to write up and put out there on, on the discord for NCDC to do that, you need people who are paying dues. And if you talk about organizations, you're not seriously talking organization and organizations. Uh, uh, you're not seriously talking about organizations and, and organizing if you're not really have a dues uh, element to the organization. And some would say that too, you know, creates some accountability because if you're putting your, you know, if you're putting your tithe, so to speak, 
into the organization you want to know what the organization is talking about what they're doing and you want to have a voice in it as well right and that's something i gotta get a little bit more serious uh, serious about on the discord we have these challenges and uh that that's gonna be one of the upcoming challenges as well i was talking to uh sister renee about that uh so that's something i think we're going to work towards soon All right but but you got to get serious in order to be able to pay these teachers they have to be taking up some type of fund right because they're not getting it from the state the government or what have you right it has to be from the community right and probably at least in the beginning from them from themselves the organizers themselves right in the chat room i see kw don seven says something he says rayard rustin or oh, bayard rustin fought against efforts for african centered curriculum uh he was too busy trying to appease guru males so yeah bayard rustin was the brother who when I say brother somewhat loosely, he was the black man who was a, a voice for MLK. I think it was him who got MLK and them on that non-violent thing. And I always wondered why did he choose that? And later on, I learned that dude was a, dude was a homosexual, All right? Out here, uh, getting getting bent by white boys or bent and white boys i don't know what one or the other or both right uh you have to be careful of who you have around you right this is why you gotta be in these people's homes right if i go in your home and i see a white boy uh freshly finished slinging dick then I know you're not a person I need to really have around, right? This is why you gotta vet everyone, you know? Revolutionary Matron says, I haven't found these institutions yet. So she's on the case looking it up. It might be the case that these, that these institutions have gone belly up, unfortunately, right? In addition to the problem of selecting, developing, and maintaining its teaching staff, NCDC also faces the challenge of developing and supporting new administrative leadership. Many independent schools have not withstood the test of time, partly because of their over-dependence on singular leadership. At NCDC, we do not believe our director can simply be imported from another setting, unless, of course, the candidate has had prior leadership experience in another independent school. All positions below that of the director are thus seen as training ground for future directors. Again, this is how organizations work. You're supposed to work your way up and through an organization. Think Malcolm X. Think MLK. Think Kwame Ture. Stokely Carmine. Right? You work your way up. And then as you've got your training, either you become the leader of the organization or you go out you create uh, a sister or a branch of the organization and you lead that branch right to this end all decisions uh, related to the school programs are first discussed and if possible resolved among the school staff themselves levels of decision making responsibility are shared among the director the assistant director and the section heads for the preschool and primary school divisions after serving as director of the NCDC for 16 years, four years ago, I stepped down and, re and was replaced by uh, Shewa Pro, who had taught in the school for 13 years, served as, as its assistant director for 10 years. This transition in leadership has been a successful one, marked the maturing of the institution. Pro is now leading the school in its expansion to a new physical facility and a significant expansion of its services. While I do, well, sorry, while I no longer serve as director, I continue to serve as program coordinator for the center, supporting the development of curricular innovations and staff development. In many respects, NCDC's evolution mimics the process of specialization one would expect to find as any business expands its scope and services. 
the other hand, what is unique is the enduring spirit of unity, commitment to collective work and responsibility, and institutional and political independence that has characterized this institution since its, since its inception 20 years ago. This brings us to a section called Philosophical Foundations, African Senate Schools. Philosophical Foundations of African Centered Schools. Uh, K.W. Don Seven says the Council of Independent Black Institutions has a Facebook page, but no active website. Good to know. Uh, Revolutionary Matron says the leaders must be fully Pan-African. Mind, spouse, and money, the leader must reflect Pan-African values. Absolutely. All right? Absolutely. To continue, African-American culture connects with Africa and reflects not only shared history, but also social relationships, belief systems, social practices, and collective responses to political and economic realities. African-centered pedagogy must take all of this into account. As I have outlined elsewhere, uh, an African-centered pedagogy should fulfill the following aims. Legitimize African stores of knowledge, positively exploit and scaffold productive community and cultural practices, extend and build upon the indigenous language, reinforce community ties and idealize the concept of service to one's family, community, nation, race, and world, promote positive social relationships, impart a worldview that idealizes a positive self-sufficient future for one's people without denying the self-worth and right to self-determination of others, support cultural continuity while promoting critical consciousness, promote the vision of individuals and communities as producers rather than a simple consumers. What do you guys think about those? Those were eight points I made there. What do you guys think about those eight points, all right, that an African-centered curriculum should fulfill? Do you have a ninth and a tenth point? Are there some points that you would revise, remove? Let me know in, in the comment section. Karenga, in his contemporary translation of the Kemetic Egyptian sacred text, The Book of Coming Forth by Day, no more commonly as the Egyptian Book of the Dead, describes ancient African principles of ethical character development as including the following propositions, which are encompassed in the concept of Ma'at. Number one, the divine image of humans. Number two, the perfectibility of humans. Number three, teachability of humans. Number four, free will of humans. And five, the essentiality of moral social practice and human development. These moral uh, propositions, in educational terms, translate into the belief that each child is capable of learning complex bodies of knowledge and problem-solving strategies, that each child has the moral responsibility to use that knowledge for the good of his or her family and community. These two propositions provide the social foundation on which African-centered education rests. More vivid terms, persons working within African-centered independent schools realize that with family and community, loving care and training, all African-American children, from the physically aggressive young boy to the snotty-nosed, nappy-headed, raggedly dressed young girl to the impudent, threatening-looking teenager have a spark of the divine within them, thus represent the possibility of perfectibility. You know, that's, that's so, that's so heavy a point, it's not funny. If you recognize the divine in not only yourself, but of us around you, I would say it, it would make it hard, if you understand it from young, it, it'd make it harder for you to be out here killing one another. 
right it would it would make it almost impossible right to to have a culture that's centered around the streets right and and that was a part of the great discussion i was briefly a part of i have to check in with it again to see where it went. i know revolutionary matron was in it too on the pan-african discussion uh disco right look at the cultural products that's going to say to, uh put it right and we got to be real about it. out here in the states if you look at africans in america you look at the culture the culture is centered around hip-hop street culture and, and and that's what's promoted by a lot of africans in america but chiefly promoted by uh these white overlords that folks have out here in the states and frankly the music gives it gives it away so even if you want to argue that point i made let's go to the music let's go to the fact that every time one of these so-called conscious uh leaders or speakers speak every so often you hear them talk about the streets and and and, and often you see them engaging in street-like behavior with all the beefs and the threats and all this old dumb shit we got to be honest about that. That's because it's a cultural thing, right? Conversely, if you look at the Caribbean, and now this is not to say no one's better, by the way. So let's let's nip that bullshit in the bud right now. But if you look at the Caribbean, right, for the most part, the exception in some instances could be Jamaica. But for the most part, if you listen to mainstream. Uh, music music produced from uh, the culture right whichever Caribbean nation you choose right you will notice that most of the music is about like gallivanting getting you know drinking partying dancing woman you know womanizing that kind of thing like that's what it's about you wouldn't really hear no one sitting up singing no song no calypso or no rake and scrape or whatever Right? You wouldn't really hear no one sitting up singing about killing nobody. And women as bitches and hoes and all that kind of shit. Like you wouldn't really hear it. So the music gives you away. Your conscious speaker, Tariq Nasheed, uh, Young Pharaoh, uh, Boyce, even Moise Watkins, and uh, what's my man, Umar Johnson, you'll always say these guys kind of digging up the streets. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? So if we want to change some of these elements, we got to really get to our youth and younger and now seemingly younger ages to let them know like you are divine, man. These things you hear in songs don't grow up to make that kind of music. And add to this culture, this 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 culture of, of glorifying the streets. You are divine. You're here for a purpose. You're here to do something. Make something of yourself and make something of your community. Make something of yourself and make something of the community that you come from. Revolutionary Matron says nine. Number nine claim the continent when dealing with other global powers allow judges uh, allow judges to among the local tribes and countrymen to rule we have to deal with all others as non-africans absolutely all right uh the revolution major goes on to say they must brainwash the african-american we finance any other Africans, we can change everything, right? Right. 
Right. So they must bring that. So the education was brainwash. If you want to change this music and change the the digging up of the streets that don't do nothing for us, you're gonna have to deal in some brainwashing by way of education. What did I tell you all about nation building when you go on on Wikipedia, right? Those Europeans especially, but there's examples of Africans doing it as well. But those Europeans uh, in the 19th century, they, they realized that you gotta control the primary schooling to unify people under common language, shared identity, and a sense of duty and loyalty. Well, you know, they talk about regimes, but for us, it's, it's to the community to our people so this is why you gotta you gotta change the education it's an absolute absolute must right uh kw dawn seven says i heard a clown say that the drug dealer was the most revolutionary of the black community uh which is nonsense absolutely is no and i've heard that too I've heard black folks sit up and say, uh, I don't knock drug dealers because they showing that they have some hustle in them. I say hustle doing what? Selling poison to your own people? Well, if they didn't do it, someone else would. In fact, uh, Vlad interviewed that black fellow. What's his name? Uh, I forgot his name now. He was he's uh he was tied up with the white boy Rick story. John Curry is it? I think I think, I think it might be John Curry. He was tied up with the white boy Rick story. And he had that mentality, because that's the mentality the drug slingers before him had was well if he didn't do it, someone else was gonna do. It. And you hear that time and time again from these degenerates in our, in, in, in black society. Right? But it's particularly troubling when the so-called conscious are exalting the streets. I, 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 back when I listened to Tariq Nishi, I remember hearing him talk about, oh, it was the hustlers, it was the street hustlers who used to fund MLK and that. Well, shame on MLK and that. If the street hustlers back then was anything like the dudes I see outside right now, shame on MLK. All money ain't good money. Understand? To continue. Reflective of the comedic proposition of moral social practice is essential to human development. These aims unite academic excellence and positive character development as co-partners in the education of youth. African-centered pedagogy thus requires a total environment in which all social relationships strive to achieve reciprocity of interdependence. Arma, 1979, describes this concept of reciprocity and its importance when he writes, quote, receiving, giving, giving, receiving, all that lives is twin. Who would cast a spell of death, let him separate the two? Mm, end the quote. A schematic representation of idealized reciprocal social relationships that independent schools strive to attain among and between children, parents, teachers, professional pairs, neighborhoods, and the larger community is shown in figure one. Let's go to figure one and look at it. All right? So we see this is the value system, this is figure one, reciprocity of social relations and African centered educational models. It's the value system you see on the outer circumference, neighborhood slash community, right? That goes to community of professional pairs, educators, social workers, psychologists, ministers, etc. right? <clears throat> the other side of neighborhood and community, going to the left, we go to parents, right? And uh, at the bottom, you have teachers, teachers feed into parents, parents feed into teachers, 
uh, teachers feed into community, community feeds back into teachers, and so forth and so on. And the child feeds in between all aspects that I just mentioned, neighborhood, parents, teacher, community of professionals, right? So, th so there's, there's this uh, ecosystem, if you will, right? This is ecosystem. And it's based on this African principle, which is the greatest good for the greatest number of African people. Goal arrived at by democratic consensus. The greatest good for the greatest number of African people. By the way, at the end of your days on this earth, right? At the end of your days on this earth, the thing you want to be able to say was that you did the greatest good for the greatest number of African people. Do you understand that? You want to be an African the ancestors will be proud of. Your black work daily, your black intentions daily, should be to pr produce the greatest good for the greatest number of African people. If that's not your mentality, then you need to make it so. You're messing up, right? You're messing up. Like, like Revolutionary Major said about this figure, she said, I love that the children are insulated at all costs and that there is a horizontal and circular structure to create boundaries, absolutely. You gotta love it. KW Don Seven says, unless the drug dealer is dealing to Urugu exclusively and using the proceeds to fund black businesses, I might be able to buy them being revolutionary. I've said something similar like to, uh, before in my life as well. The truth is, I don't know of any, I don't know of any examples of that. But I would welcome it if I was to learn of one. In fact, I would do a profile of that deal on the show, right? But I've never, heard nor seen of it myself, right? And from what I know of those MLK days, those guys were selling in their community, right? For the obvious reasons, right? But I would welcome it if I ever would have was to come across it, right? Let me uh, continue here. So that's figure one, beautiful system, you know? Beautiful system. This figure, you're gonna see me post this in the Discord as a resource for the curriculum building, right? You might even see me post some excerpts from this, from this very paper, but that figure will be in there. To continue, Arma 1979 describes, oh, sorry, I, I read that already. NCDC, like most other institutions in the independent African-centered school movement, has adopted the Nguzo Saba, a black value system conceived by Molana Karenga. Karenga is also the originator of Kwanzaa, the African-American holiday celebration. The Nguzo Saba is a non-doctrinaire, non-denominational system of seven principles that promote and support the following principles in the African-American community. One, Umoja, which is unity. Two, Kuji uh, Chagulia, which is self-determination. Three, Ujima, collective work and responsibility. By the way, that's, that's the title that we gave to the category uh, of challenges on the Discord. Ujima uh, Collective, I believe it is. Right? Four, Ujama, Cooperative Economics. Five, 
uh, Kuumba, creativity, six, Nia, purpose, seven, and my name, which is faith. All right? Uh, it's oneself, one's family, and one's people. All right? Faith in oneself, one's family, and one's people. By the way, for those of you who might not have been around when I did it, this past Kwanzaa, I actually did a, an episode a day. I celebrated each of the seven principles. Uh, you guys can go and check that out on YouTube. I haven't gotten those up on um, the podcast apps yet, but go check it out on YouTube. I did an episode for each that represented each of those days. All right, so check it out. The application of these principles as a philosophical tools for uh, institution building means that workers and IBIs must commit to engage in democratic decision-making processes, have faith in the possibilities of leadership that each person possesses, and dedicate themselves to serving the African-American community. Just because one is knowledgeable about black history and culture and likes children does not mean one can effectively teach using an African-centered pedagogy. And that's a fact, right? When we read the paper on the profile of an African-centered te uh, teacher, one of the things I talked about is that a lot of black teachers think that they're being African-centered because they put up, you know, a, a, a Kwanzaa candle and some... Uh, you know, put on a, a dashiki or put some African cloth up in the place and stuff like that through a couple of Swahili terms. That's cool and all, but you have to be truly immersed, right? That's what we got from the reading, that you have to be truly immersed to, uh, to be a teacher. Hold on a second. Okay. All right. So that's what we have to, that's what, that's what we have to start searching now. We have to start searching out real truth, real understanding, and real teaching, right? Real immersion of being fully committed to African-centered teaching, learning, African-centered communities, and Pan-Africanism, right? According to Lee et al., 1990, the implementation of an African-centered pedagogy demands teachers who advocate and are well grounded in the following principles. One, social ethics of African culture as exemplified in the social philosophy of Ma'at. Two, the history of the African continent and diaspora. Three, the need for political and community organizing within the African American community. Four, the positive pedagogical implications of the indigenous language, African American English. Right, so again, this paper is more African American centered. So, of course, if you're talking about uh, uh, clinging to you know becoming more immersed in language, of course, it's going to be African American English that they're talking about, uh, which is also known as I think, yeah, AAVE, right? Or well, some people call it Ebonics, right? Ch uh, five child development principles that are relevant to the positive and productive growth of African-American children. Six, African contributions in science, mathematics, literature, the arts, and societal organization. Seven, teaching techniques that are socially interactive, holistic, and positively effective. Eight, the need for continuous personal study and critical thinking. Nine, the African principle that, quote, children are the reward of life, end of quote. 10, the African principle of reciprocity, right? That is, a teacher sees his or her own future symbiotically linked to the development of students, right? And by the way, I read a paper from Arma that talked about this as well, right? It's a, it's a strong concept, right? Reciprocity amongst African people is a strong concept. We gotta start doing more of it. Right? We have to do more of it. Right? In the uh, chat room, Revolutionary Matron thinks like me. Uh, 
She said, that's going on a t-shirt. Put that on a t-shirt on the dog. Doing the greatest good for the greatest number of African people. That's what you want. At the end of your day, that's what you want to be able to proudly say. That's the kind of epitaph I would want to have on my uh, tombstone. Right? But it requires you to, to actually right, do the greatest good. If you're not already, it's time, to, it's time for you to start doing the greatest good for the greatest number of African people, right? Do it wherever you are, do it locally, and try to expand. KW Don 7 says, most drug dealers that I have known always take the proceeds and buy shorty overpriced goods from Europeans. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Isn't it the case in Judas and the Black Messiah? Isn't there a scene where the Rainbow Coalition is trying to get the gangs to cooperate with them and the gangs are like, no, you you messing with our you messing with our business or something like that, right? Am I am I mistake, mistaken about that? Right? So to glorify the streets is nonsense for me. If a few street dudes did something positive by giving some some money to fund MLK or whomever, and then went right back to selling Caron to their people, you kind of ne you, you you negated the act that you did. Further, to embody such principles in, in one's teaching. Teacher must be well read in a black classic education. Madhu Budi in 1990 has offered an excellent reference list of 200 books that he believes conscientious black people should read. To expect teachers to be such well read individuals may appear demanding and unrealistic. Yet, deliberatory objectives of African centered education demand that teachers, students, and parents alike must learn to be more than they think possible. You know, along these lines, and by the way, I, I would like to see this list. So for you guys who are out there helping me with the research, uh, uh, maybe the reference here for 1990 might have something in there, right? But I like to see these 200 books. Uh, I am almost certain they're going to be American sent, right? This is why I'm advocating for us to become more Pan-African centered. There are works from the continent that are probably, that, 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 that would probably, you know what's funny? There are some writings from the continent, if translated to the English tongue for the Anglophone uh, Africans in the world, right? That if, if it was translated and readily available, right? That will probably change a bunch of people's lives overnight. But of course, we don't have access to it. We don't even know about it. We're not compiling lists that include those type of books. And that's why, by the way, I'd like to get more folks from across the diaspora, right, on the Discord. Uh, the Pan-African uh, discussion, I'm pretty certain, has way more membership, and they probably have more folks from across the continent, you know, so that's something I like to even put in there, uh, if only to say doesn't mind, uh, a question about books that from the continent that will kind of change or help to change the perspective of Africans outside of the continent, right? We wouldn't know because who's going to make those lists if we're not making them, if our people aren't making them ourselves. Also, one of the challenges we have on the Discord, Jay Quellen and I talked about this and put it together. It's kind of exclusive because I want serious people to join the challenges uh, categories and channels on the Discord. So if, you want, if you're serious and you want to be a part of it, hit me up in a DM and tell me, hey, I'd like to be verified and added to those challenge channels, right? But one of the challenges is that, you know, and, and I'm taking it straight from Gavi, we should be reading like four hours a day, right? 
right now if you're listening to this podcast you could be reading a, like Gavi said have a radio in your library and listen to lectures and intellectual conversations and etc while reading there's nothing wrong with that right you could be listening to this and 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 reading uh you know an, an important book at the same time we should be striving for i'm not saying that you're going to get to it but start small and build up 30 minutes a day is easy get an hour that's easy hour and a half then two right after two hours it gets a little bit more difficult for some i, I I'm, I'm sure but at least try put in an hour a day right and if you want to be involved in curriculum and stuff like that you have to be fully immersed which means that you have to be well read you have to have a lot of knowledge right to continue in the early years of ncdc's history when both teachers and students were learning it was not unusual for the staff to read PJ and attempt to replicate some of its classic developmental tasks with children at the same time that they were studying and implementing innovations in educational practice from uh, Tanzania, Cuba, and the People's Republic of China. One NCDC teacher even traveled to China on an educational tour sponsored by SIBI. Now, I don't know why you would have to you know uh Piaget and and travel to china I, i'm sure africa is rich with knowledge rich with examples i'm sure you know i have this book on african philosophy i'm sure uh you know we have a lot of uh guys like arma who i, who I mentioned a couple of times in this paper have written books on african philosophy so i'm not certain why you have to travel to china unless these are folks who are kind of like and they're from chicago no they're from michigan right uh but these are folks who uh probably were influenced by the black panthers who were also maoist and all that old shit uh so that's probably why but we don't need to really be give, bringing in you know anything outside of the african diaspora the influence of an African-centered worldview and organization on, of instruction can be illustrated by three examples from classroom practice at NCDC. First example explains the organizing principles behind the NCDC science curriculum. Second demonstrates problem-solving approaches in mathematics, while the third describes language arts activities representative of those that routinely occur in a third grade classroom at the school. Additional examples are described in Lee et al. From 1990 so i will have to definitely look up lee's paper from 1990 because this is a this is pretty much the idea i had for the curriculum that we're working on now right you fo f first focus on science all right second problem solving all right like in problem solving in mathematics which is part of science curriculum anyway and the third is the language arts. And so, you know, like we've talked about in the past, right? You're supposed to connect all these things. You're writing about, in English language, you're writing about what you learn in history, what you learn in socials, what you learn in science, right? And you're bringing all those things together in one cohesive whole. Uh, to continue. The linking of content knowledge in subject areas to philosophical and social principles is a critical element of African-centered pedagogy. One of NCDC's founders, Soaini Walton, or Mama Soaini, as she is called, I used to work with a DJ, DJ Soaini. I wonder what's up with her these days, but I used to work with her when I used to work on music back in the day. Uh, uh, developed two diagrams that graphically represent a conception of science that is consistent with African philosophical systems. The first diagram, figure two, shows that all human, animal, and plant life, as well as their organic and inorganic matter, exists within a universe of symbiotically linked relationships, patterns, and orders. 
similar ontological framework has been described in the philosophical systems of many African kinship groups, according to Mbidi, 19, uh, in 1907, right? Other cultures also revere the earth and respect the inherent order of the universe. For example, many Native American kinship groups view land as being held in trust. I'm gonna come back to this diagram in a second. By a community of people for the creator. It is this tying of content knowledge and subject matters like science, the philosophical and social principle that marks the foundation of African-centered pedagogy. What such, an, what such an outlook shares with other people is part of what makes such centering a human endeavor, right? So let's go back to figure two. <clears throat> like they said, um, this figure uh, shows that all human animal, human, animal, and plant life, as well as their organic and inorganic matter, exists within a universe of symbiotically linked relationships, patterns, and order. So look at figure two, science as a study of symbiotic relationships within a natural order, right? So you see, again, we're dealing in circles, boundaries, as, our, as Revolutionary Matron pointed out. And we see the kind of Venn diagram relationship of things. So in one uh, diagram, there's survival, habitat, aggression, and defense. Right? In another, there's organization. In another, there's function. Right? And together, they intersect to, uh, to show the interrelatedness, right, of everything in life. And inside here, there's the, the committed pyramid that that's divided in sections from going from top to bottom h a p o i right so when we go down here now we look at on the organization there's structure there's form there's characteristic there's properties on the function there's capacity there's operation there's power there's usage and that intersection that we talked about uh, that intersection that we talked about where the pyramid has H-A-P-O-I, that stands for human, animal, plant, organic, inorganic, right? So at the center of these three things, just to be clear, center of organization, function, survival, there is human, animal, and plant, right? Outside of that intersection of the three, right, you have the organic and the inorganic. And I think that's a pretty neat uh, diagram, right? In figure three, the processes of scientific investigation are embedded within the circle of unity, one of the seven principles of the Inguza sub. So figure three is here, right? And it says the five basic levels of material, the five basic levels of material existence are enshrined in the pyramid, right? Because the figure has a pyramid, which represents purpose or Nia, the fifth principle. While the eye of wisdom represents the process of observation of the natural world using the five senses. This diagram communicates that science is not a mere collection of disparate unit plans, but rather part of a systemic way of viewing the universe and our relationship of, as humans to that universe. Thus, teachers and students are empowered to see the patterns and relationships in nature and to learn from those patterns. I'll tell you all something. As you guys have heard me say this before, I'm an adjunct lecturer at a local college. I teach, um, you know, general biology and microbiology. One of the things I always notice, right? One of the things I always notice is that students don't recognize that what they've learned in math, what they've learned in physics, what they've learned in chemistry, are all related to the things that they're learning in biology. 
when you look at the molecular structure of DNA, for example, right? All of the reactions that you would find in, in organic chemistry can be carried out in one form or the other with DNA. Carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens, phosphorus, etc. You can carry out chemical reactions with the units that make up DNA. Right? And a lot of folks don't understand, like, if you learn your chemistry pretty well, right? You learn your math pretty well, you learn your physics pretty well. Right, because the reality of it is this. Math is the foundation of everything. You learn your math, then you move to your physics. Physics is the application of the mathematics that you learned prior. Then you move to chemistry. Chemistry is really the study of the physics, right, of chemical reactions. Within chemistry, you will learn about the organic and inorganic elements that make up what you will study in biology, right? And I realize that a lot of students don't do well uh, in these science classes because they don't realize the interconnectedness of these subjects. And I, I believe I truly believe a lot of black students don't do well because they're not taught the interconnectedness, which is something that I believe they will naturally resonate with if given it in the proper way. You feel me? So that diagram with the pyramid that we just looked at, right? That diagram here that shows the pyramid Right. Uh, you know, that shows a, a, a 3D representation of the pyramid, right? With the with the with the H A P O I, again, human, animal, plant, organic, inorganic. Right. That's how we should be. You know, that's a concept we need to keep in mind. Right. When we talk about the scientific investigation. Uh, in, in science, etc., we need to keep this symbol in mind when we're talking about building a curriculum, right? That starts with building a science curriculum. Anyway, some have argued that teaching our American school children about numeration systems from other parts of the world is a waste of valuable instructional time because they will not be required to use such notation systems in today's world. Others contend that adapting mathematics to multicultural contexts can have positive intellectual consequences. African centered schools maintain that considering why different groups of people at different time periods develop distinct counting systems, for example, helps students to understand that mathematics serves real world functions. It is not an artifact of the classroom, and that it is not a finite or static science. Over the years, NCDC students have learned to count and use the notational system of both the ancient Egyptians and the Yoruba of Nigeria, as well as the base 10 Arabic notational system in which we in the West are accustomed. And, and that's why I say in the curriculum, making it Pan-African, you, you can start learning how to do basic counting in Yoruba, how to, you know, uh, as a part of your language curriculum, how to do basic conversational you know, in your Yoruba. And you do that one semester or a few weeks, and then you switch to, you know, the Akan. Right? Or, or you switch to the Kemetic, and you just go through different systems. And also, also, and this is important too, show where these sciences come out of the Kemetic science. So show where the root word or, or the terminology for something in the, say, Yoruba, comes from Kemet. 
and connect the continent in that way for the learner. Primary instruction is, of course, given in the latter system. However, exposure to the Egyptian system reinforces the student's understanding that the base 10 system involves regroupings of sets and multiples of 10, a concept more visually evident in the Egyptian system. See what I'm saying? This also helps distinguish the amount of quantity, the amount or quantity, from the notation used to represent the quantity. Further, teaching students to do long multiplication or division using both the traditional algorithm and Egyptian methods helps to solidify the understanding, I'm oh, sorry, the underlying mathematical concepts behind these operations. Let me tell you all something. In the real world, if you have to solve a problem for your family, yourself, your community, or for whomever, and you use the Egyptian method, it's still all right. Uh, 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 even Urugu would have to come and be a complete jackass to come and tell you, I see you use the Egyptian method. Well, is the outcome what you wanted? Well, yeah, but I see you use the Egyptian. Shut your dumb ass up. Even if in, even if it, if you're if you're in that situation, where you're problem solving for them, which is what you don't want to be in, right? It still works. So it's not a waste of time. Is the point? Games such as the Shango networks and the Oware games of West Africa have also been incorporated into the CD C curriculum. You guys know I love games. Chief of them, I love Mancala. Let me tell you all something. Europe, I've talked about this briefly in the past. Europeans have taken the Mancala game. Right? Europeans have taken the Mancala game and actually used it in computation and, 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 and program writing. Think about that. Games are essential. We got to start doing our research on what are the different games. I know a lot of, like, Mancala is a game that's played across the continent, called by different names, right? We got to find those games. Um, there's a game, I think, is it Oweri? There's a game that's like, tic, that's like tic-tac-toe and all kind of stuff like that, but Africans play it really fast. Like your, your, your mental has to be on point to play these games. So you're, you're building up the mind of the learner. Not only do you have to learn the rules, learn the strategy, but you have to be able to implement them very quickly. Right? So go look back on some older episodes where I, where I talked about it in the past. I don't remember the title of the show, but I'm sure if you peruse the titles, you, you'll find it. Right? As, as Al Slavsky in 1990 has noted, Games of strategy help children to acquire skills in logical inference and decision-making. Important training for solving problems in the technological society of the future. He wrote that in 1990. Or published that in 1990. And by the way, I think Zaslavsky, I think he might be one of the big authors. No, no, in fact, that's a she. I read a paper from her, which is the paper I was referring to about Africans and the ability to count and count quickly and look at a pile of stones and be able to uh, be able to, to better estimate how many stones are in the pile and say even some Harvard educated folks, right? And, and I, if I'm not mistaken, she wrote the paper on the Mancala game and how, uh, and others have, have cited her in, um, in how they've like written programs, right, to help them, or, or code to help them, you know, based on Mancala to help them solve problems, right? In schools such as NCDC, the linking of cultural knowledge to traditional school subject matters is only one part of a comprehensive environment. Cultural studies are not restricted solely to review of historical events, nor exclusively to the continent of Africa. 
For example, at the third grade level, presently the highest level that the center teaches, social studies and reading instruction are merged in a unit that addresses a critical issue in black life today, family responsibilities and expectations. Using the SIBI social studies curriculum, the children are guided to read trade books about black families of various configurations to extrapolate for themselves a set of criteria that defines a quote unquote good family. They are then asked to use that criteria to think about and discuss their own families. In another instance, classroom discussion of a text from the fourth grade, fourth grade Basil reading series asks students to examine the diary of the Puritan explorer John Smith and look for any evidence of bias in his observations about the Native Americans with whom he and other white settlers came into contact. You know, there's actually some merit to that. I know there's folks who would say, oh, there's nothing you can learn from white folks, but that's not true. That's not true. If you study their ways, you can understand their tactics. Right? You study their ways, you can understand that you study their writings. They give up a lot of information in their writings, but like they say about black folks historically, you want to hide something, put it in a book. Right? So it might not be a bad idea. Now, you don't want to get too immersed in their stuff. Because if you do that, then you become the public fool system. Right? But if you're, if you're doing a critical study, a critique of, right, of some writings that they have, some excerpts of writings that they have, it, it actually could be beneficial in teaching our people our children, who their worst enemies are. Mm. Keep that in mind. For those of you who are volunteering for the curriculum, keep that in mind. To anything you've read before that you can pull an excerpt out of, a chapter or whatever out of, and, we, and, and it's used as a source of understanding the worst enemy we've ever had. Smith's encounter is then contrasted with an account from Wounded Knee, a children's version of a Native American's eye view of the clash of cultures between whites and indigenous peoples during the colonization of America. Uh, without any lecture on the part of the teacher, the children are asked to compare and contrast the two perspectives. The purpose of these lessons is to challenge the children to think to help them develop a questioning stance toward the traditional story of the founding of America they can expect to receive when they move on to the public school. Uh, again, that's a good point. If your kids still have to interface with their educational systems until we're able to build our own, right, uh, at least they'll be able to go into those educational systems like some of my kids can, and question and kind of laugh at the nonsense that's being pushed on. Right? Up here, figure four, we didn't talk much about it. Oh, well, actually we did. Uh, the comedic of Egyptian procedures for multi-digit multiplication and long division. So they show you how it's done. They say multiplication is done by repeated doubling and then adding the products. The process can be seen as another representation of the distributive property. So 19 times 34 equals 19, right, in parentheses, two plus 32, all right? So 19, so they're breaking down 34 into two plus 32. Whenever they have a number in front of a bracket, that means to multiply. So, so this is another way, instead of saying 19 times 34, they're saying 19 times 2 plus 32. So then they get the, uh, so then they multiply both 2 and 32 by 19, but that's what this operation means. So that will give you 38 plus 608. 
So now all you have to do is add 38 to 608 to get 646 as the outcome of 19 times 34. And in fact, if I, I'm not mistaken, I think only to say I actually posted some mathematical questions similar to that. Like how do you guys go about doing math? So when you guys multiply, you guys are with me live, probably listen to the playback. How do you guys go about uh how do you guys go about uh doing multiplication in your head when you have like you know not so simple multiplication to do is it similar to what i just to what i just gave All right or is it like the example above it where what they did was they did a multiplier of 19, so 1 equals 19, 2 will be 2 times 19 equals 38, 4 will be 76, 8 would be 152, 16 times 19 will be 304, 32 times 19 is 608. So they did a, a, the job of doubling, right, until they got to 32, and then all they had to do was add the corresponding value for for the second uh for the second doubling which is 38 and then for the 30 32nd doubling which is uh 600 608 right and then they add those two things together right and then they did something similar with long division right the, uh yeah they did something similar with long division i'm not going to bother to read it but you got you guys should get the idea this was adapted from Moyo, 1991, and Zaslavsky, who's a white woman, like I said, 1979, right? So that brings us to this, I believe the last section, the creation of community in African Senate schools. I wanna thank all of you who are here listening. I know there's only Matron and uh, KW97 speaking in the chat, but I see there's a few other folks who are listening here today as well want to thank you all uh, uh and i want to read these uh messages here revolutionary matron says i believe that knowing the translations by jacobus capatine with his history would help shatter the christian myth uh i read about capatine on this show i don't know if matron knows that or not i read about capatine on the show capatine is uh i'll just say interesting character uh revolution major goes on to say i agree astrology is a mathematical message about you from the universe math is a universal language spoken everywhere absolutely uh she goes on to say one of the things that i notice is that as each of these emerging ideas was published the underfunded african-american communities compulsory education communities compulsory education more and penalize parents for not sending children to the public school system and Rushi matron says my jamaican grandfather said that if we were cannibals why didn't we eat them yeah that's what i'm saying so it might not be bad to have our children read the bullshit small doses so that they can learn to counter the nonsense, right? When you really look at history, these folks were cannibals. These savages that we have to deal with were cannibals, right? They have a, a funny way of projecting their bullshit onto us. And a lot of us take it in fully and start to live it themselves, right? Like, like these folks like to talk about the black folks they show some video of some black kids fighting in, in, in mcdonald's and they'll put on the newspaper savages who's the biggest savage you've known in history still to this day come on yeah let me take a quick uh station id break i'll be back on the other side to finish up this paper stay tuned you are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DAX. You tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community. 
only on KWAZ Radio. Peace family, this is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Also, you check out those shows, but also, you know, reach out to the Queen's Council and see what's up. Let the Queen's Council know that you missed their show and you want to, you know, see more content from them. Uh, also, check out the Revolutionary Matron Show on YouTube. She's in the chat right now. Click on her name, if that's possible. And go and like and subscribe to her channel. Check out her videos. She has a few up. Go and check them out, leave a comment. Let her know, you know, interact with all the hosts of the shows on the KWAZ Radio Podcast Network, right? Interact, it's a, it's a big deal for us. Uh, the creation of community in African-centered schools. As parents, educators, and citizens, proponents of the independent African-centered school movement have institutionalized Armour's 1979 conclusion which is there is no beauty but in relationships. Nothing cut off by itself is beautiful. Never can things and destructive relationships be beautiful. All beauty is in the creative uh, purpose of our relationships. The mind that knows this destroys will set traps for it. Destroys traps will never hold that mind. There is no beauty but in relationships. When you look at what's going on with the little sub movements within Africans in America, the ADOS, the FBO, the, the FBA, I'm about to say FBI, the FBA, right? When you look at that as an ugliness, the beauty is in relationships. Look at what you have in common more than what you don't. Stop with the childish name call. Which, you know, which is what they call xenophobia and all this old shit, right? Stop with the Akata and the uh, booty scratcher and all this old dumb shit that y'all on. Stop talking about people running from their country when it's, when it's the U.S.'s uh, foreign policies that cause people to have to leave. Stop being complicit with what, with what America is doing out there. Get back to being in societies with people who are your people. No matter where their geographical origin may be from. There's a beauty in that type of relationship. There's no beauty in all the bicker and beef nonsense. To continue within independent African-centered schools, Distinctions between family and community are often blurred. At NCDC, for example, all teachers and staff are referred to by the title of mama or baba, right? Kiswahili for mother or father, and their first names, right? That's something we do in the conscious community. Both students and parents refer to teachers and staff by these titles. This practice makes a public statement that teachers serve an L loco parentis function for the children. NCDC teachers are required to assume responsibility for the character development and academic achievement of their students. They also strive to ensure that families become and remain supportive of their children's physical, social, and moral development, as well as their educational development. These expected social relations are made clear to parents when they enroll their children in the school. Indeed, teachers at NCDC have been known to call parents on the carpet for not fulfilling their parental education responsibilities. To this day, to this day, uh, young adults who attend NCDC 20 years ago still address me as mama, although there is clearly no social requirement that they do so. Such precedents are not unknown in the African-American community, particularly during the period where, before widespread integration, uh, when middle-class and working-class families lived in the same neighborhood, and it was not uncommon for teachers to be students' as neighbors. At the end of the day, at NCDC, 
It is not unusual for parents, teachers, and children to linger around and within the building interacting with one another, not yet ready to leave. School families and teachers often develop long-term friendships that extend beyond their stay at NCDC. Many of the best friends of the NCDC alumni are classmates they met while enrolled at the school. At NCDC, simply producing scholars is insufficient. Our students are encouraged to try hard to achieve meaningful levels of mastery of academic concept and to share their knowledge with others. We seek to help shape whole human beings who recognize the beauty of their blackness and their culture, who are kind and responsive to one another, who can contribute not only to their own families and communities, but to the forward flow of human progress and civilization. Although some may view our goals at NCDC as idyllic and impossible, in the face of the grave crisis that challenge African Americans today, such goals must be seen as basic requirements for survival. The heroic efforts of African Americans to obtain education during slavery and post-reconstruction eras provide ample evidence that what seems impossible can be achieved. Many narrative accounts tell of African slaves hiding books and struggling to read in the dark of night under the threat of horrendous physical punishment and even death. The widespread growth of Sabbath schools among African American churches in the South and of reading clubs in cities in the North provide further historical testimony to inspire and undergird NCDC's belief in the power of community-based, culturally responsive, and politically conscious efforts to educate black people in America. This is a section called race, I'm uh, sorry, called implications for public education. To suggest that the independent African Center school movement is without problems would be to give a false impression. The National Support Network for the Independent African Center School Movement, the Council of Independent Black Institutions, is underfunded and as such has not been able to provide the level of support that its member institutions desperately need. At the same time, the stability of the National Teacher Training Institutes and its National Science Fairs for students in Sydney schools has been a source of continuity and reinforcement for independent schools expansion of teacher training services for public school teachers and its publication of a social studies curriculum guide represents significant growth. Many IBIs that started in the last two decades have fallen by the wayside. The reasons for the demise include lack of adequate funding, centralizing leadership in a star, a quote unquote star individual or elite group, inadequate in-service training for staff, a narrow ideological foci with little grounding in or support from the communities being served. Oof, that's heavy. That's heavy. It takes, if you care about something, you put your money behind it. These white folks have a saying, put your money where your mouth is. Why do you think they, they use the mouth, right? People are led by their belly. So you, if you, if you about it, put your money where your mouth is. If not, shut the f up. Black folks, if you about it, put your money where your mouth is. Put your money behind these type of movements. Doesn't have to be with me. You might want to go to a, a, a more well-established, but hopefully that well-established is not is not using uh, outdated uh, models of, of of learning, right? But put your money where your mouth is. It's a shame that African-centered schools are suffering like that. But at the end of the day, it's because these schools cannot be funded by the government. They need to be funded by the people. And folks, folks just, just say, you know what, I, I'll send my kids to the public school system for free. But I don't put no money up there. 
That's how you lose. To continue, some of the surviving schools do not provide developmentally appropriate instruction. Others require young children to master meaningless rote material. So other schools are not broad enough in their base to attract children other than the biological children of their organizational members. Nor do they attract families who are not explicitly political pan-Africanists or those from poor and working class backgrounds. So again, I mean, this whole paragraph is fire because this tells you where we're failing. Remember what I said about nation building from Wikipedia and remember the role of primary education. How are you going to ever get to a nation? This is why I think the nation of Islam and all that shit is laughable. How are you going to get to nation and you don't even want to put up the monies that will support your kids getting the education they need for nation building? For nation obedience, for nation respect, for nation uplift. Likewise, disturbing is the lack of formal presence of educators from IVIs among the national publicly visible leadership in the movement to include African-centered education in the nation's public schools. Much of the leadership in this drive give only lip service to the contributions that the independent school movement has made to shaping the current national discourse. Yet IBIs can provide real direction to efforts at the local levels to implement African-centered curriculum in public schools. They also provide tangible examples of African-centered education as more than merely teaching children to recite African proverbs, wave red, black, and green flags, and recognize black heroes and heroines on a wall. You see, that's the shit. I want to avoid that. By the way, I recently asked, uh, I, I, I try to ask a question of the day every couple of days. I, I, I should do it every day. But I asked a question about who would you post uh, pictures of in your home? What, what, what African, African equal in black, would you put up a picture of in your home? One time ago, black folks, especially here in America, had like Kennedy up in their house. Uh, some had Lincoln, right? Some had white Jesus, some had MLK, right? Who would you, and this is a question to you guys listening, you guys can put it in the comment section down below. Who would you put up pictures of in your houses? Right? To continue, indeed, IBIs represent the laboratory schools for the development of pedagogy and projects that reflect African worldviews and interests. The experienced staff have developed comprehensive classroom tested unit plans and curricula that do not depend on commercial basal series or Eurocentrically biased textbooks and they have engaged as professionals in extensive ongoing study. They and their institutions have learned how, as the old folks say, to make a way out of nowhere. Put that on a t-shirt too, underdog. The question then is whether schools such as NCDC and other city schools represent bastions of narrow separatist anti-American institution or whether they offer some promise of hope for public education. The answer lies in the old saying, the proof is in the pudding. The achievements of IBI or IBI graduates uh, speak the most powerful truth. They are, decidedly not, they are decidedly not among the gang members, dope dealers, high school dropouts that plague our communities. NCDC alumni have graduated from or currently enrolled in some of the most prestigious public schools and gifted programs in the Chicago school system. Even NCDC graduates identified as having learning disabilities have been found to hold their own in public schools. Public school principals enthusiastically welcome the NCDC graduates because they have come to expect these children to enjoy reading, patiently engage in mathematical and scientific problem solving, think critically about social issues, be well-rounded in their creative interests and talents, and behave well. Right? Isn't that what you want for your children? or the children around you? Radare, in 1989, in a survey of results on standardized achievement tests of students from the cross-section of independent schools, not all city schools, but including NCDC, found that on average, children from these schools achieve that or above grade level. 
These figures stand in stark contrast to the generally disparaging figures and forecasts of achievement for so-called minority and poor children in public education. In making these comparisons, however, it is important to note some important distinctions between independent African Senate schools and public schools. Class size in the former is generally smaller. Although research suggests a smaller class size in itself is not a determining factor in student achievement. This point is especially evident in the class sizes of countries like Japan. More important, enrollment in independent schools is based on a selective rather than an open admission process. And unlike public schools, IBIs are not bound by union contracts that force them to retain teachers who fail to perform. Mm. Mm. You see that? Yet, in its 20-year history, NCDC has accepted every student who has registered to attend, and only two children have ever been asked to leave the school. In primary grades, NCDC has actually tended to accept more students who have not had success in public school. The achievements of NCDC and other independent schools cannot be attributed to an influx of money, nor simply to the commitment of its staff nor can it be attributed to the mere inclusion of African-American and African history in its curriculum. This is not to suggest that money is not required to address the ills of public education in the United States. Rather, the issue is to what ends money should be directed. NCDC survival, expansion, and maturation can be attributed to four reasons. The long-term commitment of most of its founders the implementation of strategic planning to expand leadership capabilities and responsibilities among staff, the governing board's adoption of a realistic attitude about the financial, ideological, and professional needs of its staff, and for an unwavering belief in, on the part of school personnel that African-American culture is both a lifeline to Africa and a buoy to keep black people, black children in particular, afloat amidst widespread societal confusion and danger. Many will argue that these expectations are not realistic for public education. However, uh, perhaps so, however, the problems faced by African Americans as a group, especially by poor African Americans, are so monumental that only monumental solutions will correct them. The quality of our collective future depends on reclaiming the minds of our children who are far too often lost to the streets. Am I talked about streets? Hmm. Let me read that again. The quality of our collective future depends on reclaiming the minds of our children who are far too often lost to the streets. Whether it is realistic to expect public schools, even those that serve completely African-American populations, to adopt an African-centered pedagogy is questionable. Nevertheless, the principles that have inspired the pedagogy and cultural, the cultural environment of, of NCDC and other independent black schools are human and humane, stimulating and inspirational, a worthy model for others to follow. And that's the end of the paper. I want to point out something that I read a few minutes ago. All right? Uh, they talked about in the twenty year in the twenty year history of NCDC, they accepted every student who was registered to attend. Only two children have been asked to leave. You know what's important about that statement, as well as the idea that you get rid of teachers who don't perform. That's what you do as a nation. As a nation, that's what you do. You get rid of the do nothings and the no goods. You try with them. And if it ain't working out, it ain't working out. You don't force that. But you first try. And that's what that's a message I want all of you to have in your mind as you go about your black work in society. You try first. You won't get everyone we know that, but you try. And then when you can't get them, you let them go. 
I want to thank all of you for listening. I hope this paper, I hope this paper energizes you in some form or fashion. Right? I hope this energizes you in some form or fashion. Revolutionary Matron says, we need this on the Discord. I will post this paper, as well as the episode, on the Discord. I'll post it as part of the curriculum resources. Right? We need that, right? Uh, Revolutionary, Revolutionary Matron earlier said, uh, we are testing right now. Let us know what you like so we can develop content you want to hear. Once fully developed, we will submit ourselves to the KWAZ network for review. Right, so that's, that's Matron talking about her show, right? And by the way, we would, we would welcome Matron already. Matron has been embraced by the pro-black perspective. I only test it. Right? She's been embraced by me behind the scenes. She's been embraced by Kare, who's not here tonight, and, and, and by others. So we will welcome you when that time comes. Abuja Matron says we need to start with our family members and tell the family origin story. Speak of Garvey, Mumumba, Toure, Clark, Nani, Nzinga, and Shirley Chisholm. Hmm, but that's the folks she would put up on her wall. But she makes a good point. And, and, and that's something that we have to be conscientious of too. When I was a kid, I'm old enough, when I was a kid, people weren't, you know, back on the island, people weren't walking around with cameras all the time. You know, we had Polaroids and those little flash cameras and stuff like that, but it cost money to have that stuff. People didn't have it. So honestly, there's very few pictures of me as a child. And I'm not alone in this. If you're a certain age, you know that's true. Very few pictures, and, very, and less pictures of your parents, and even less of your grandparents when they were young, right, if at all. So it's something that we gotta start really dealing with as people. We gotta start putting up the image of our ancestors. We've been in a time now for a while where we can do that. You can capture yourself in a picture. You can capture your mom right now, you know, in a picture, or your father, or both, actually, right? But we got to start creating these family trees in our homes, as well as display pictures of Africans who have done great things, right? Thank all of you for being here tonight. Join the Discord. This is what the Discord is really for. Right? The Discord, I'm only pushing for it to be Pan-African because we're trying to build a Pan-African-centered curriculum. But if you want to go to a Pan-African Discord that has lively discussions, join Onita says Pan-African discussion. Discord serve. Right? Matron is on there. I'm on there. And a few others who frequent this show are on there. Right? But if you want to get down with curriculum or get down with personal development challenges, because that's what the personal development challenges really are for, right? It's to, it's to make you more immersed in African tradition, culture, communities. Join now. Right? Join the Discord. The link is in the chat. The link is in the description of this episode. Right? Let me go through and thank the folks who were here. There's not, well, there's not a few. There's only a few, I mean. There's Revolutionary Matron, who has been just awesome since she started coming through on the show, and tonight is no exception. It's KW Don 7, who's awesome. Who's here every time I do a show. He's he's he, he, even if it's just a check in and say, hey, I'll 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 catch the replay. He's here. Right? Make sure you guys subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Hit the like button, click the bell to be notified when I have new content coming up. I'm currently in a bit of a, a bit of a break from the show because I have some family responsibilities to take care of. But as you see, when I have a chance, I'll pop in. In fact, don't be surprised if I have a... In fact, let me state it. I'm going to do a Shoot the Breeze episode on Saturday. If you have topics, you know where to go on the Discord. 
Leave your con leave your comments of topics for the sh Saturday Shoot the Breeze episode. And I'll come through and I'll do a Saturday Shoot the Breeze this coming Saturday. Alright? So thank you guys for being here. I appreciate you. Uh, join me on Saturday. Join us on the Discord. Until next time, be safe. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ Radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.